And so, hello everyone. Welcome to the workshop, Building Data-Centric Applications uh, with Roshni Malani and Priyal Agarwal. Uh, I'm Jalpa Patel, uh, the MC for the day's workshop. And now I'd like to take the privilege of introducing the speakers for today. Uh, Roshni Malani is an engineering leader at Snorkel AI, uh, building core programmatic, lab programmatic labeling and iterative model development experience. Uh, she previously has managed team building uh, internal tools for AI ML organizations at Apple and was also one of the founding engineers on Google Photos team. Uh, she has received her PhD in software engineering from UC San Diego uh, and she believes uh, that the true potential for machine learning can be unlocked by collaborating on data. Uh, Priyal Agarwal is a machine learning engineer as well at Snorkel AI. Uh, she was gradu graduated from Columbia University with a master's degree in computer science, specializing in machine learning. Priyal previously has collaborated, uh, worked on software engineering at Microsoft Azure and an intern at Amazon Robotics. Uh, she is also a vocal supporter of women in tech and has served as director for Women Who Code in Delhi. Today's workshop focuses on understanding the principle and strategies of data centric model. Uh, before we start the workshop, if you have any questions, you can post it in the chat uh, with a queue as a prefix so uh, the facilita facilitators can identify them. Uh, also, lastly, if you have purchased a ticket to the summit, and if you're joining for the talks on November 17th and 18th, uh, you should be receiving an email for hopping uh, by uh, today or early tomorrow. I will now ha hand it over to Roshni and Priya. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, today, we're gonna be chatting about building data-centric applications. Um, it's one of these kind of shifting um, things that's going on, kind of a data-centric approach. We'll explain what that is and how building AI applications can become much more efficient and um, um, collaborative and iterative and uh, get you, you know, kind of a really great solution in a very uh, short amount of time. Uh, the next slide uh, is introducing us, uh, the presenters. You got a great introduction uh, already. And so uh, I guess the biggest benefit on this slide is you can contact us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So you have our handles right there available for you. So we're gonna start by talking about what is data-centric AI? Isn't machine learning all, has always been about data? So why are we hearing this term kind of float around more recently? Well, we can understand data-centric AI by starting with a comparison to where it has um, had been kind of from a development perspective earlier, uh, which was kind of a model-centric approach. In this approach, uh, training data is seen as external to the ML application development process. You just start with it thanks to someone else's hard work, and then iterate on the model components. And the focus is on the ML model to be able to learn from that labeled training data. So some of the key operations include uh, feature engineering, model architecture design, and training algorithm design. In many settings, what, this was what was the dominant mode, a model-centric approach. The data came before the core development process. But now there is this shift from a technology perspective and a community perspective to treat the model as more relatively fixed instead and spend more time on the data. And so the key operations here include labeling, slicing, augmenting, managing, and curating your data. Training data is now the key focus of the iterative development process and is a key differentiating factor. Actually, Successful models require iteration on both the training data and the model. It's not an either or situation, right? And so what we're talking about today is a relatively shift in focus and how that affects the techniques that we use to both develop and deploy AI applications. So the talk today is gonna be centered on these three key principles of data-centric AI. AI is centered around training data. And if the data is the center, then the interface needs to be better than manual curation and must become programmatic. With a programmatic approach, we actually unlock 
the ability to iterate on data quickly and beyond that in a more guided and prioritized fashion. And of course, AI development workflows have to include the people who know about the data, the domain experts. And by collaborating with them, we can actually accelerate data-centric application development. Our talk today will go into the details of each of these three principles with case studies that really help illustrate how to build data-centric applications in an effective uh, and cost-efficient manner. So the first principle, data-centric AI necessitates an efficient programmatic interface. To help us really understand why we need a programmatic interface for data-centric development, let's take a look again at the typical model-centric iteration loop. Here you can clearly see how data scientists and subject matter experts are operating in silos with no common means or tools for collaboration. Labeling data is often seen as a manual, tedious and expensive process that's done by the subject matter experts. Often it's a one-time task because doing it again would be very onerous. So basically the data scientists are blocked on the data until it's been labeled and kind of tossed over this imaginary wall and the data, center, cent, data scientists are constrained to iterating on the model with marginal improvement that's observed. So to dive more into the data, uh, data scientist workflow, we can sh see a shift from the manual feature engineering to deep learning models. From a practical sense, today's models are much more powerful and push buttons since they learn from these large data sets. But it's less easy to know what to do when something is wrong. Um, and so today we are blocked on data. Real world cases that need uh, domain or subject matter expertise, maybe um, from folks who are kind of trained uh, inside large organizations, right? And uh, data is often highly private. Imagine medical records, financial data. Right? And data in the real world often has objectives uh, that change rapidly, right? The distribution of data changes or the objectives of the ML um, application change. And we have to be able to kind of keep up with these um, rapidly changing goals. And so in all of these cases, manual manually labeling data and curating it is just a non-starter, even for the largest of orgs. I'm gonna dive into a little bit to, uh, around hand labeling to really illustrate the point. Imagine each dot here represents a data point that's available. For simplicity, you would split into a training and validation set. The validation set would of course need to be hand labeled, but also the training, data, uh, training set would also need to be labeled. Um, and you try to label as many data points as possible, painstakingly labeling them by hand. As you can see, manual labeling tends to be slow, expensive, and static. Also, there's many ethical and governance challenges around manual labeling. How do we inspect or correct biases? How do we govern the data that's controlled by millions of data points? How do we trace the lineage of how a model came up with a particular label? And so these are some challenges that are kind of critical for machine learning model, uh, machine learning application development at the scale that it's done today. To give you kind of a concrete example, imagine trying to design a clinical trial where we wanna understand the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, we might have all types of data, such as patient records, billing codes, scans, um, et cetera. And we wanna be able to label programmatically in order to maintain kind of privacy safe and compliance. And so here, uh, as the you know, objectives change for the trial design, perhaps there's new test results to incorporate or latest medications or current prognosis, right? We wanna be able to adapt and it becomes really difficult when we're labeling each data point kind of manually. And so to tell us more about programmatic labeling, I'm gonna hand it over to Priya. Awesome. Thanks so much, Roshni, for explaining all the pitfalls in the traditional AI de application development cycle. So as an alternative to working in silos on the labeling and training aspects, what we are proposing here today is an iterative development loop focused on the data itself. So the process is kickstarted with labeling data using programmatic labeling. We'll discuss the details of this in the coming slides. 
but also talk about what we mean by the second step here, which is integrating data. Uh, we use the label data set from the first and second steps to train a machine learning model. Traditionally, in the last step of the development, practitioners focus on hyperparameter tuning of models as the only source of improvement, right? That's also because uh, traditionally we have considered data labeling and model training as two processes separated by a wall, as Roshni mentioned before. But here in the analysis stage, we also try to identify gaps in model performance uh, by utilizing a number of analysis tools and by looking at the data points where the model predictions were incorrect. And so as a result, we go back to stage one refine our sources of supervision that we had previously used to label our data here and continue on with the cycle, uh, the same cycle. And this loop is kind of not limited to the first time you're uh, building your application. The same iterative loop can be repeated after deployment uh, for say monitoring the slice of production data or uh, changing your application or labels when uh, you detect some data drip, for instance. So uh, let's talk about programmatic labeling, uh, which is kind of the key enabler to the data-centric iteration loop that we're talking about. So instead of labeling each data point painstakingly by hand, programmatic labeling allows you to label entire sections of data using these abstractions that we call labeling functions. You can think of labeling functions as code for labels, where the input is a data point and output is a label. And you can dump each and every source of signal that you have to help inform labels for your data. Uh, but of course, these LFs can be noisy or they can correlate with each other, they can overlap with each other and so on and so forth. So this is where the power of weak supervision comes into play. Um, as weak supervision based frameworks like Snorkel, denoise and aggregate all of these sources of supervision to give sanitized labels. And as you can see here, programmatic labeling is a much more efficient way to label your large training sets in a fraction of time daily. What do I mean by weak supervision? Weak supervision kind of allows you to rapidly encode domain expertise to program your training data sets. Now that's really powerful because with this you can encode and wrap up different sources of supervision. It could be pattern matching. Uh, it could be just a database lookup. It could be using existing organizational resources or uh, third party models or even crowdsourced labels or you know, most importantly, encoding intuitions for, from subject matter experts. So all of this can be wrapped up in this weak supervision paradigm to help inform uh, supervision for art labels. So for instance, uh, let's say I have a financial uh, machine learning application uh, wherein I want to classify whether a particular financial document is a credit agreement or not. Uh, so a few examples of LFs could be pa a pattern matching based, for instance, uh, if the title of my document has the keyword credit, then I want to label it as credit agreement, for instance, or if any keyword in my entire document matches a list of some financial terms that I have in my organization existing, uh, then I would call it a credit agreement. Or uh, if um, I, I don't really want to reinvent the wheel, uh, I want to be able to use my existing resources. And so if my legacy system thinks that it's a credit agreement, then I call it a credit agreement. So now that we are leveraging all these noisier, uh, but more efficient supervision sources, the trade-off that we are making here is speed for noise. So we need a mechanism to denoise and aggregate all of these supervision outputs. Now, this is where uh, weak supervision frameworks like Snuffle come into play. They allow you to dump all your expertise, take that as input, and combine all of that into sanitized labels. And of course, at Snorkel AI, this is relevant, uh, relevant to the work we, that, that we did and continue to do on the academic side, right? For instance, how do you combine the outputs in a provably consistent way? And so here, uh, what I uh, want to say is that weak supervision ends up being a, a key foundation technology that lets us iteratively build not just models, but also the training data itself. And uh, additionally, uh, now that we have encoded all these forms of supervision in a programmatic way, it becomes really easy to audit these LFs and change them if needed. The concepts that we are talking about are applicable not just to text, but all other data modalities as well. So for instance, for an application which detects if a tumor in an image is, say, regular or not, we could write an LF which encodes a doctor's expertise and intuition. So something like if the tumor has a high perimeter to area ratio, then I want to label it as irregular. Or you know, for time series, uh, you could say, if the value of my data point is different from the past three data points, for instance, by 50%, then I want to label it as anomaly. The second key takeaway that we want to highlight is that 
using these concepts of data centric ai you can iteratively develop your application in a guided and prioritized fashion to really drive home the point about uh, this iterative development that we're talking about let's take what we call the hello world application in machine learning which is classifying ham versus spam emails uh, so uh, i took a data set that contains 500000 plus emails from 150 employees of the enron corporation this data set is actually publicly available on kaggle uh, and each data point is an email which contains a subject and a body as shown here in this example and we want to predict whether an email is spam or not so for my application uh, my input uh, data is the set of emails that i have now i could write some uh, very basic lfs to get up and running uh, i have two lfs here for this case study one each for ham and spam um, the ham <laughs> labeling function uh, says if email body contains discuss or see attached then i want to label as ham and similarly a, a very simple lf for spam says if email body contains weight loss then i want to label it as spam so these are just like one simple lf for class that i have written to just get up and running with my application without using any ground rules till this point um so now using uh, uh weak supervision frameworks like snarkle i get my training data set labeled from this uh labeling functions which uh, in turn i use to train a final machine learning model such as a simple model like logistic regression to get my final predictions so one thing uh, uh, that i want to note here is that i don't really need any hand labeled data for getting up and running with my application but having said that uh, a small amount of ground truth for evaluation splits would be helpful to anchor the development on uh, like roshni mentioned earlier So with this one iteration, uh, I got an accuracy of eighty-seven point three percent using a very simple logistic regression and count vectorizer based model. Uh, by this iteration, I mean uh, the the process of writing labeling functions, getting your uh, training data set, and then training a machine learning model to get final predictions on it. Um, so this score is not bad, but let's see if we can, uh, if and how we can uh, further improve our performance on this task. so <laughs> one uh, frequently used error analysis tool uh, one that we are all familiar with is the confusion matrix um, but let's see how we can use this uh, error analysis tool in a data centric fashion uh, so uh, here i have ground truth on the left and predicted labels on the top the biggest error bucket for instance that i see here is this one where my model predicts some emails as spam but the ground truth for them so it predicts as ham but the ground truth for them is spam uh, so i want to improve uh, my model's performance uh, by handling these false negatives here so what i would do is kind of you know double click into this bucket and uh, actually dive deep into the individual data points which my model is falsely predicting uh, to see if i can find some pattern in that and uh, uh, kind of improve from there so here i have uh, a few examples uh, that i found Uh, where the predicted label is ham but the ground truth is spam right so here the subject is uh, subject of the email is help my family out of this and then there is uh, a huge body in here another email uh, says uh, has the subject i want to help you feel healthier and then yet another email has the subject with a keyword help uh, and nothing else so one common pattern that we are noticing in these three data points for instance is the uh, presence of this keyword help recurrently so um, a common uh, like one first idea that comes to mind is to write another lf to improve supervision in this particular bucket so this this could be as simple as saying if email subject contains help then i want to label my data point as spam so this is my iteration 2 where i wrote a new lf i uh, again uh, ran the weak supervision framework to get a training set and then i trained the same logistic regression model on top of it uh, which yielded a 2.4% increment in accuracy for me um and note that i'm using the same model as before i am not doing any hyperparameter tuning at this point so here we can notice that the uh, previous number of uh, data points incorrectly classified in this bu bucket was 39 which has decreased to 25 now so this is uh, an improvement here 
However, uh, in this confusion matrix, we still see that uh, the biggest error bucket uh, is this the same one. So maybe if we can go back and look at the data again, we'd be able to find more patterns. Uh, another uh, uh, error analysis tool that we have at our disposal is the label distribution graph. So the x-axis shows the percentage of data points covered uh, and the y-axis shows each label, which in our case is spam and hem. Now there are three lines for each label, one each for the ground truth. Uh, the second one is for the training set, which is kind of the output of the LFs that we write. And the third one is the final machine learning model. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see, uh, the ground truth uh, for this distribution uh, for ham and spam is pretty much the same. So my data set that I have originally uh, isn't imbalanced. However, uh, the current training set has more hams here uh, than spams. And similarly, there is an imbalance in the final output predictions for the machine learning model. So this means that our coverage uh, from labeling functions for spams is not enough. So how about we start working on this, uh, on bridging this particular gap? So uh, kind of following the same pattern as before, an idea that comes to mind is to write a new LF that would cover more data points for the spam class. So I went through a similar process of diving deep into the data points that were being misclassified to find a pattern. And uh, another simple LF that I came up with says, if email body contains money more than two times, then I would label it as spam. So this is my third iteration, right? Where I'm going back to the data, writing uh, new LFs or like looking at individual data points to find some patterns, writing new LFs, and then uh, getting my training data set and uh, training a uh, model on top of it. Another idea uh, which we have frequently used in our traditional pipelines is to uh, fight the class imbalance by oversampling. Uh, so the minority class, which in my case would be the spam class. So um, I would just, uh, I can of course use these existing ideas to improve my model, right? So I would just oversample the spam class in, your, in my uh, model training to improve performance. So with this third iteration, uh, I got a 2.7% increase in accuracy using the same model as before. So overall, we have seen about 5% increase in accuracy through this like tiny uh, time-taking <coughs> iterations through the data itself. Uh, note that the label distribution graph that I have now uh, looks pretty balanced. So I would say this is a pretty good performance uh, that I have here. So hopefully uh, this mini case study kind of showcases a little bit of how by using these you know, very specific error analysis tools that we have, we're able to take the guesswork out of uh, improving our model. Uh, so it's much less about training, uh, much less about tuning the hyperparameters or <laughs> staring at loss curves, which I am guilty of doing, uh, but much more about specifically addressing error buckets and driving insights by looking at these data points individually and making very, very systematic improvements and support. Thank you so much, Priyal. Um, there's one question in the chat that I'd love your perspective on. Um, mm -hmm. One of the attendees, uh, Christian, asks, um, why not just use the rules in your labeling functions instead of a machine learned model on top of them? Wouldn't the machine learned model uh, just be trained on these deterministic rules anyways? And so wouldn't you get better performance using just the rules themselves? That's a great question. Um, so uh, I would like to think of it as this way. Uh, using these rules, you are encoding domain expertise and you know, kind of injecting what you know about the data uh, uh, and encoding that in the form of labeling functions to create uh, to get a training data set. However, machine, you kind of need a machine learning model on top of it to generalize over your entire training data set. So uh, let's say if you have a few data points that are uh, just like individual data points that are not being covered by these generic rules, what your machine learning model would do is learn from your entire space that your data lies in and then uh, try to predict on top of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes great sense. Um, I think the way to kind of make sense of this is that um, the rules give you just um, patterns in your data, right? And the same pattern, um, uh, uh, different patterns might apply to a particular data point, right? So which rule should you use and things like that is what kind of the label model helps us 
um, you know, denoise and make sense of. And then training a model on top of that will help us, as Priel said, kind of um, generalize beyond just the rules to points that we haven't covered yet. Awesome. So we're going to go on to kind of the third principle of data centric development, um, which is you know, um, understanding how this shift to focusing more on the data is leading to more performant AI systems, um, but also being able to go beyond that to understand, you know, and, and make systems that are more fair, more robust, and more scalable. And so, um, you know, by focusing on your data, we have to think about who knows your data best. It's your domain experts. And um, we will see how by empowering your domain experts with multiple ways of sharing their expertise, not just the label, but the context and nuance of it um, will help you actually accelerate your development of AI applications. Um, and so what we need to do is kind of unblock data. We wanna start thinking about how we can um, how we can have the data scientists and machine learning engineers in an organization work together with the subject matter experts to capture knowledge most efficiently. How can we collaborate to maximize the value and the velocity of the data labeling process? We can get higher value annotations um, by allowing subject matter experts to use their time more efficiently than just tediously hand labeling. We wanna maximize the transfer of their knowledge. And with higher value labels and more context and information about the data, we actually end up getting more accurate labels. We also work with them to um, increase the velocity of getting these uh, more accurate labels. We must have less friction um, than kind of emailing spreadsheets back and forth. So the key insight here is that as we shift from focusing um, our iteration process on the model to iterating on the data, we need to bring the power of modern collaboration tooling. Think Google Docs, think Git. Um, all of these real-time collaboration features with version controlling um, for our training set. And so um, the goal is to kind of help you reduce the development time and improve the quality in terms of correctness and performance. So to unblock your data, we're going to actually build multiple ways to capture domain expertise from within the same product. I'm going to give you a high-level overview now, and we'll explore each of these features in depth with a case study. Uh, so some examples of higher value inputs. Uh, these are ways to kind of maximize the bandwidth of information we can get from our subject matter experts um, as to provide them with the ability to you know, give their expertise at many levels, starting with comments, which are just kind of free form context about a data point that might be providing the why behind a label, uh, tags, which will help kind of um, catch kind of properties about your data points, allowing us to kind of cluster the data in ways that might provide deeper insight. Of course, the labels, you know, kind of serving as ground truth. We also want to give them kind of low code, easy templates that help kind of capture patterns in the data to start helping them to label their data programmatically. And of course, um, give the kind of full code ability to encode all of the heuristics and domain knowledge as well. This diversity of inputs allows subject matter experts to share rich information about their data with the data scientists, kind of multiplying the value that they can provide. And also, we must kind of lower the friction so we can kind of increase the iteration speed by working together in an integrated kind of product. Um, and here, we're going to, you know, make sure that everyone, um, both you know, domain experts and data scientists, see a consistent view of their data points in full context. Kind of no more passing snapshots of spreadsheets back and forth. We should be able to kind of request annotations simply with a shared link. Get real time updates of the labeling progress with full support for versioning. And when there are difficult splits, we have to be able to kind of take portions of the data that the data scientists have a hard time labeled programmatically or covering with model generalization and kind of focus the manual labeling efforts of the subject matter experts with the push of a button. And so to show you, not tell you how this approach kind of enables um, AI teams to collaborate both synchronously and asynchronously to get labels with more value at higher velocity Let's dive deep into a case study. Let's imagine we operate a bank called Snark Bank. This is a fictional bank that provides loans to small and medium-sized businesses. 
This is a running fictitious example that I'm gonna be using today kind of based on lessons that we've learned by working with um, real use cases. It's gonna demonstrate the quality and speed with which you can adapt to changing business requirements, such as your label understanding evolving, your label schema changing, or your data drifting. At Snark Bank, let's say we have um, highly skilled loan officers that help us evaluate business loans. These loan officers kind of specialize in specific industries of which there are thousands. As you can imagine, the loan application for a boutique cupcake store is gonna be quite different from one for an automobile manufacturer. And so the goal here is to build an AI application to route a new loan application to the appropriate loan officer who specializes in that industry. So to start us off, uh, to start us off on this classification application, we're gonna have 500,000 um, loan applications in our database. We have a thousand classes and zero labeled data points. Our data scientists and subject matter experts have sat down together to capture expertise as heuristics, using some of the same kind of technologies as Priyal showed you earlier. And the first idea that we could have is if the exact text of the label or the industry um, is in the loan application, then that's the label. We could use some keywords from the dictionary or generic ontology to also help us programmatically label, or we could also add some of the auto-suggested labeling functions that our platform provides for you. Um, and so during this process, we've generated about 300,000 data points kind of programmatically labeled and ready for training. So how do we evaluate whether any of these heuristics are any good? Well, luckily, we all have already started this process of collecting some hand-labeled ground truth for evaluation. We only selected a tiny random subsample, about 1% of our data points for validation because that's all we really need. Because we want the highest quality labels we can get for our test set, we asked several loan officers to label the same batch of data points. And they don't need to finish annotating all the data points. We can just give them kind of a fixed amount of time um, and then take a look at what they've done, uh, see their kind of agreement rates, aggregate the data and commit to ground truth and be ready to use for evaluating our model. Instead of pinging for progress and being able to see uh, being unable to see partial results, we're actually going to build um, you know, this into a full kind of tool here. And um, we're going to kind of basically have the senior loan officer make sure that the junior officers who are labeling independently within the same um, product are on the right track. And so you can see the overall completion rate, the daily annotation rate, and the individual annotator completion status. And to make sure that the quality of labels is high, we can also measure inner annotator agreements, off, uh, optionally broken down per class. Furthermore, we can denote the senior loan officer, Annie in this example, as an expert and see her agreement rate with the junior officers. We can choose which annotators to aggregate before committing the labels to ground truth. Now that you've seen the basics of uh, creating batches for annotations, which can be analyzed, aggregated, and committed to as ground truth, we're gonna walk through three scenarios that demonstrate the dynamic, messy environment in which long-lived AI applications tend to be developed, where the iterative loop of improving model performance requires data scientists to collaborate with their subject matter experts in the same product. As you will see repeatedly, collaborating on the data will increase the value of our data, uh, and the velocity. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the first example, which is when the label understanding changes. So um, imagine our data scientists have trained a model, are looking at the analysis and kind of digging into the analysis for each class. And they recognize that the annotation instructions weren't clear and they were interpreted differently. So for example, the keyword nursery uh, was understood as garden supply um, or some others interpreted as childcare. And so we wanna filter the data points about nursery and click to create a batch for annotation, right? These are our known unknowns that we're looking at. And our data scientists and subject matter experts are gonna refine our labeling functions or create new ones, retrain our model, rinse and repeat. And so hand labeling a few data points helped us to kind of provide more confidence on our model evaluation. And so this example really illustrates the velocity. If filtering to create a batch wasn't 
as easy or as integrated into our product, then um, we possibly wouldn't be able to address kind of the messy ground truth labels to ensure our model performance metrics are as accurate as possible. Another common problem is that the label schema tends to change. For example, you may want to add or remove a label, split a label, merge labels into one. Um, so the example here is to split the label restaurant into two different ones as kind of um, culture is changing from brick and mortar to also including kind of food trucks. Um, mostly because kind of the loan application amount will be quite different and they're gonna go to kind of two different um, loan officers. So again, we're gonna kind of rinse and repeat the process of getting subject matter um, expertise kind of input, refine or add uh, labeling functions and request kind of targeted hand labeled data for ground truth for our evaluation. We can also request annotators to add tags for property of the data that we care about. Um, that might kind of inform our labeling functions such as price or popular meal times. And so you can see that um, you can actually get more value, a little bit more information about each business to inform uh, how we kind of create or modify our uh, labeling functions. And as a last example, let's take a look at data drift. In this situation, um, we kind of have deployed our model and identified a particular slice of production data that we wanna monitor. Let's say pharmaceutical companies. And we tend to notice this drift in label distribution for a particular uh, class. Turns out that lately, there have been more loans coming from businesses involved in vaccine manufacturing industry, as well as industries involved with the associated kind of transportation infrastructure. Not only are we able to identify this trend quickly from within um, the product, but we're also able to address it. And so as a result of kind of being embedded in the same product as data scientists and having been through the collaborative iterative loop many times, our domain experts are now able to identify patterns and encode them using kind of these low code interfaces. And so this uh, example actually demonstrates both the value and the velocity of our data labeling kind of increases over time as you iterate on your AI applications collaboratively. So let's review the key takeaways from today's uh, workshop. First is that uh, data-centric AI application development requires a much more efficient interface for our, um, labeling our training data. That is specifically, it requires programmatic approaches. Um, using this programmatic approach, we can actually unlock this iterative development loop focused on our data that's actually guided and prioritized as Priyal demonstrated earlier. And finally, by collaborating with the folks who know our data best, our domain experts, we can actually accelerate data-centric application development. Um, there's a lot more resources at the website below. Uh, thank you all so very much for attending. Thank you to the entire team at Snarkle who kind of helped uh, us put this together. Uh, thank you to my co-host Priyal. Thank you all for attending. We're happy to help answer any questions that you may have. Let's see, taking a look at the chat. Um, Michelle, Mitchell, sorry, I didn't read that right. Mitchell asked, are you looking at the validation data to determine new labeling functions? Um, so that's a really great question. You can uh, look at both the ground truth if you happen to have it, um, but usually you wanna kind of have the separation between the data you're using for training and the data that you're using for validation. And that's because you don't wanna train on your validation data. So if you have limited ground truth, you wanna make sure you have enough set aside for a validation set. And then if you have more than that, then you can use some ground truth on your training data set um, to help kind of guide your labeling functions. But you don't wanna train or develop labeling functions by looking at your validation set. Your validation set should be kind of blind to you. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Pru? No, that's perfect. That's exactly right. So awesome. uh, yeah, just sorry, just uh, one point. Uh, when you're kind of trying to refine your labeling functions, you go back and look at your training data itself, not the validation data. Yep. Exactly. Hopefully that helped you out, Christian. Uh, feel, oh, sorry, uh, Mitchell, feel free to ask more questions. Uh, Christian asked another question. Can we measure the time spent by labelers on individual tasks to allocate resources more effectively? That's a great question. Of course, any tool for hand labeling should be tracking not just completion rates, but kind of time taken as well. Um, 
However, usually we're kind of on a fixed amount of time that's um, spent and rather focus on the quality of the labels as well as the um, kind of agreement, right? You want multiple people to kind of agree on the same label uh, for a given data point. So those are a little bit kind of metrics that are a little bit more important. Um, we're often working with large companies that have a small data science team right, of engineers. So these are large corporations, think you know, banks as an example that I shared with you, uh, or they could be insurance companies or telco companies, or, um, or they could be you know, biotech companies. Often these companies are large companies that have um, a lot of subject matter experts in-house, right? Um, and of course, these experts are you know, gonna be lawyers or doctors or folks that require a lot of um, money per hour, right? Um, to label your data. So yes, kind of the time that they spent on labeling is something important to measure, but more importantly, we wanna make sure that they're annotating correctly. So we're guiding our you know, application development more correctly. Um, so that's gonna be a little bit kind of higher priority. Both are really important. So that's a great point, Christian. Anything else you wanted to add to that one, Brielle? Mm, that, that's perfect. <laughs> awesome. Um, the next question is from Ben who asks, would you consider a labeling hierarchy? So for example, food, restaurant, and then food truck. I found using this in the past can get you really good model performance higher up the hierarchy. That's a really great point. Um, when you have about a thousand labels like I did, a uh, thousand classes like I did in my example, often breaking it down more hierarchically will give you much more model performance. It's much easier to kind of categorize industries um, more broadly, right, as uh, food, um, maybe like retail and stores, manufacturing, construction, right? These kind of larger categories are going to be easier to do. So yes, you will get um, really great kind of model performance at the higher end of the hierarchy. And also it'll focus kind of the labeling functions related to, let's say, you know, restaurants down into um, a very specific model. Kind of breaking down the composition of your models is a really great approach when you have, especially a large kind of label space like we talked about. So it's a great point then. One thing that I would like to that uh, would be that uh, programmatic labeling really shines in this space, right? When you are when you have say a thousand classes uh, and you want to break it up into a hierarchy, uh, you don't want to pass the same data points again and again to your subject matter experts to like label thrice if you have three levels in your hierarchy. So you would rather program like programmatically label entire sections of data at once. It's a great point, Priyal. Awesome. The next question is from Tanya. I'm sorry if I'm butchering all of your names. I'm trying my best to keep the um, give credit to the question asker, um, but I'm, I'm so sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly. Uh, do you have resources to work with time series data annotations such as speech signals from automatic speech recognition tests? Uh, that's a great question. Priyal kind of demonstrated one example of looking at time series data. Um, and so, yes, we are building up a kind of set of low code, no code templates for time series data. Um, and there's a lot more to do that with audio in particular that we're super excited to do, um, but we haven't quite uh, gotten there yet. Priyal, would you like to add anything else to that point? No, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, I mean, we are currently working with, so for instance, at Snorkel, of course, we are working with uh, uh, some applications where we are actually looking at time series data to say, uh, detect some anomalies, for instance, and we are, we have interfaces to work with them directly, as Roshni mentioned, like the low code or no code interfaces, or you know, even like using third party libraries if you want for uh, data scientists to really dive deep into something uh, that they want. Um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Awesome. Um, I guess one quick thing I'll add to that we're creating these low code, no code kind of templates to help bridge the gap for subject matter experts to start being able to encapsulate patterns that they're seeing in their data. Um, but of course, kind of the open source snorkel as well as um, our platform itself allows folks to write full code uh, if that's available to them. And so if they have data scientists or machine learning engineers who are able to encode um, the patterns with, with code, then a way they can write with Python, right? And that's also a great option for kind of these other types of um, data and, and uh, the other types of um, labeling functions that they would require. The next question, I'm really gonna butcher your name, so I'm so sorry. Uh, Sydney or Sydney? I'm not sure the it's right Sydney. pronunciation. Sydney. Sydney. Uh, it's a beautiful name. 
Um, do you have recommended methods that can guide improvement from labelers to have higher impact on the labeling functions? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say here is uh, what we want to do is kind of help them prioritize their time, right? Our labelers are um, folks who have a lot of expertise and they get that expertise from a lot of training, right? So basically their hourly rate is pretty high. And so what we want to do is make sure that we maximize and um, the, the and make most use of the time that we have with them. And so what we're going to do is write um, filters on our data, right? We're going to kind of capture the portions of our data that we need their help on the most. And so it might be um, if none of the labeling functions even try to vote on a data point, right? These are our kind of uh, known unknowns. We're going to focus their labeling efforts there. Or um, we might have unknown unknowns. We're going to try to find a way to capture those and have them focus their labeling efforts there. We might have, as I uh, gave in another example earlier, um, kind of conflicting information on what nursery means, whether it's like a garden store or a child care center. So we want to focus their efforts, particularly on areas where we know we need their help. Um, and um, Do you have like a preset set of heuristics was my question, basically, that I see. generalize as a template? Um, it's going to be pretty unique to each application, so it's hard to come up with those kind of um, our guidance is going to be around where you don't have any label coverage, you know, from the labeling functions is a great place to start. And then if you're seeing any conflicts, those are kind of the two places that you want to start. And then from there, it's going to be kind of dependent on um, your application. And so one approach, another approach to kind of take a look at is um, the example Priel gave where your label distributions don't match up. So you might want more examples labeled as spam in that case to help guide you in writing your you know, more labeling functions for spam so that your um, label distribution is kind of the same across both your ground truth, your programmatic labels, as well as your model inferences. Cool. Priyal, did you have things to add? No. <laughs> did that help answer your questions with you? Yes, thank you. Of course. Um, the next question is from Kevin. He actually has two questions. One is, uh, does it require sharing our unlabeled data to Snorkel? If I have a database of some unlabeled data, how much engineering effort is needed to set up the Snorkel UI so that subject matter experts can easily see the data and help with that iterative error analysis process? Uh, these are great questions. Sorry, I didn't realize uh, the second question was very long. Uh, so let me uh, how about Priel? You take a first stab at the answers. I've been answering a lot of the questions. So let's start with the first <laughs> Your question. answers are great, actually. <laughs> yeah. Does it uh, require okay. sharing our unlabeled data to Snorkel? Uh, so just a clarifying question there. Do you mean uh, utilizing uh, Snorkel AI, the platform, Snorkel Flow, the platform? Uh, or uh, are you referring to using, say, the open source library that we have for Snorkel? Uh, I wasn't sure about um, the distinction. so. Uh, either, I suppose. Okay, so let's say uh, if you're uh, developing some application individually and you want to make use of Snorkel OSS, uh, which is uh, like an open source library, which is being used by multiple companies, uh, actually, uh, you could actually just, you know, download that library and uh, pretty much start label uh, writing labeling functions uh, right off the bat. So you would have data set uh, in your own environment and uh, you could, um, just add some Python decorators and uh, use like the Snorkel interface to uh, start writing your labeling functions. Whereas if you want to use, uh, you know, Snorkel flow the platform, uh, we have multiple um, kind of deployment approaches. Uh, if you don't want to share any data uh, with the company, you're free to get the Snorkel flow instance deployed uh, in your own environment where nobody but you would have access. You're also free to, uh, you know, share uh, your learnings with us so that uh, we could kind of help you uh, uh, iterate on, on your data. Um, does that help answer your question? Uh, Roshni, would you want to add something? No, I think that's great. I think it's important to know that um, Snorkel AI, the company, and Snorkel Flow, the platform can be deployed, you know, air-gapped and completely on-premise. On um, and so, you don't have to share any um, any data labeled or not with uh, Snorkel, the company at all. And that's kind of one of the really key tenets of the companies to be able to 
label data in a privacy uh, centric way. Um, so privacy is a really key value here. Um, I think Priel kind of covered the point right on. The oh, second, Kevin, that was that, sorry. Yeah, that was great, thank you. Okay. So the second question, let's make sure we answer it, is if you have a database of unlabeled data, how much engineering effort is needed to set up Snorkel UI? So here I'm assuming Snorkel flows the platform um, so that subject matter experts can easily see the data and help with that iterative error analysis process. Priyal, do you want to take a stab? Sure. Um, so uh, uh, let's say, uh, like Roshni mentioned, you're uh, using Snorkel Flow, the platform. Uh, so here, uh, kind of in Snorkel Flow, we have everything pretty much set up already with very pretty uh, user interfaces, which uh, a few screenshots of which act actually Roshni showed in her slides. Uh, so it's like a very low code interface, actually. You would just have to click a few buttons to help upload your data onto the platform and get started. We also have what we call like application templates uh, using which you can get started off uh, with the exact kind of application that you want to build right off the bat. So uh, examples of some application templates that we have is uh, uh, document classification, for instance, or uh, uh, time series classification, um, named entity recognition, for instance. And basically we have a host of these uh, and then could just like double click into that application, upload your data and get started with looking at your data. We, like Roshni mentioned earlier, we also have like multiple low code or no code rather interfaces so that SMEs don't really have to dabble with the Python code itself. Uh, and you could just, uh, you know, write one LF, see where it's voting, where it's going incorrect, correct. Um, and yeah, basically get started right off. And then we have auto ML. Uh, so you write your LFs, you push that auto ML button, it could train a model with you with some hyperparameter tuning. And then you can move forward with trying to analyze how your uh, model and your LFs are performing. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. These are all the questions. Oops. Another question from James. Um, oh, thank you for the kind compliments. Uh, he asks, uh, in the case study for ham versus spam, did you test the performance of just directly training the logistical regression model without any um, labeling functions? Uh, that's a, a great question. Uh, so um, I actually uh, do not have any labeled data apart from the evaluation splits. So I would uh, like my logistic regression model and <laughs> would not be kind of able to learn from the data because I like for training, uh, providing inputs to my model, I have to provide both the X and the Y. So in this scenario, I don't really have the Y because I don't really have any ground truth labels in my case study. So I did not test that, but that's a great question. And um, uh, one thing that I could probably do is say, use my validation split for training and then uh, have a te separate test split on which I uh, have those numbers. But unfortunately I do not have those numbers right now with me. I think uh, Priyal's answer really helps to showcase that you don't need any ground truth to help guide uh, your process of creating and um, refine, uh, refining labeling functions. Um, and so you can kind of look at the data and kind of find intuitions or patterns yourself. Like we've all seen spam emails, so we kind of have this intuition already. You can just start finding patterns and encoding them, allowing you basically to multiply the effort that you put into labeling um, your, your uh, training set. Uh, so James asks a clarifying question. Um, the predicted Y hat was compared against the rule classified Y, is that correct? Uh, so the predicted Y hat is the final output from the machine learning model that I had and I compare that. So this is the output from my training set. And uh, I compare that with uh, like I make predictions on the validation set and I compare that with the ground truth that I have on the validation set. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, so maybe another way to kind of explain that while we get a confirmation from James is the, the predicted Y hat is the prediction um, for the label for a data point in your training set. And then you're gonna use the Y hats to basically train that logistical regression model. And then that end model, the logistical regression model is what you're gonna use to cause um, on your validation set. And so you're gonna be uh, creating inferences on the validation set and comparing it to the, those um, validation set kind of ground truth. 
So Y hat is the makes up the training set, basically. Does that help clarify? Oh, okay, awesome. We got some uh, confirmation from James. So of course, to help, you know, happy to help answer any more questions that you may have. Anyone feel free to, you know, video, audio, text, any way that you would like to share questions with us. We're happy to help answer them for you. So Rahul asks, um, how can we use similar strategies or practices beyond classification, like using GANs to create higher dimensional data? We work with 3D models, and as you can imagine, uh, we lack the right data, and it's a huge issue. Priyal, do you want to take a stab at this one as well? Um, that's a great question. I think I would need a moment to answer that. Uh, meanwhile, Roshni, feel free to <laughs> answer if you have uh, something. Yeah, um, so higher dimensional data is a bit of work. Um, and of course, figuring out um, you know, ground truth in some instances is difficult. Um, sometimes actually it ends up being easier to find patterns in your data. Um, and so I guess it really depends on the particular kind of 3D data that you have or higher dimensional data that you have. Uh, and if you're able to kind of go through it and find patterns, if you can find any patterns, any heuristics, any hints uh, about your data that gives you some inclination of what the label might be, then this approach would be a great fit for you. Um, one example that kind of comes off the top of my head is we were working with someone who had um, network data and uh, network data is, you know, like literally IP packets. And so they have a bunch of um, numbers basically, right? The um, you know, destination host and destination port and source host and source port, like not, um, not very much in terms of like looking at each data point and figuring out the label is really hard for them to do that. But they wanted to be able to classify the network traffic in the kind of rough big categories. Is it YouTube traffic, Facebook traffic, uh, Amazon traffic? Um, and looking at each data point kind of manually is really impossible to figure out what's going on. Um, but you can start finding patterns on it, right? Um, so there's um, maybe, um, X number of packets in a small amount of time frame. They can start finding patterns and as soon as you can find any pattern in your data, you can start writing up uh, labeling functions. So it might not be easy, unfortunately, to capture it in the kind of low code, no code templates like we have built into the platform, but we also have integrated the full SDK. And so uh, you can basically write a Python function or many uh, to start capturing um, your, your patterns in your data. Um, and so if you are able to find patterns in your data, or if you're able to use um, other models or other um, kind of the embeddings from other modeling techniques as, as features and inputs, you can start using those as well. Um, and just kind of you know, bring that into your, um, as inputs into your labeling functions. That's another approach you could use. Pril, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that if you're, are you uh, looking for say generating data itself or like augment your data set? Or do you have data already? And the issue is that you're not able to say, label it efficiently, generating data itself, I see. So what the label model uh, does is, um, by label model, I actually mean uh, the step where we kind of integrate all the LFs and B noise and everything. Uh, so that's what the job of label model is. So it's kind of a generative model. Uh, so instead of say having uh, a end machine learning model, which is kind of the classifier on top of it, uh, you could probably use the generative model, the label model itself to uh, uh, somehow apply, uh, apply uh, it in your application. I think I would probably need more details as to what your exact application is to suggest something, but I guess we could start from there. Wouldn't it be a little bit risky to do that? Because on one hand, your labeling functions, you're kind of trying to capture some information. And uh, if you do generation of data with some functions, they would like almost feel like they're offsetting each other's benefits. Uh, what do you mean by offsetting uh, benefits? Like uh, you're saying that uh, through LFs, kind of you're trying to capture domain expertise. Whereas yeah. uh, when we say that we're generating data, we're not exactly using that expertise, is it? Yeah. I mean, you are synthetically creating data and you're writing functions to label like that data, you know? Sorry um, if I'm not able to clarify. 
yeah no worries at all so actually uh, i would probably not dive deeper than this <laughs> uh, i i have to go back and read a few papers but i can definitely point you to the papers where uh, we're talking about say data augmentation uh, for instance using uh, these labeling function interfaces uh, i personally do not have a lot of depth into that one so i would refrain from commenting further but i do know that there is a lot of work done in that space where like you know we're kind of augmenting data uh, uh using uh, the speak supervision framework let me actually look for a link and uh, get one yeah sydney you bring up a great point about um both generating data and finding patterns in that data kind of coming from the same source you can kind of have some human solutions around a problem too and so maybe you have two different teams one that's uh, responsible for generating the data and another team of folks you know kind of create this arbitrary wall between them and um, that way you can kind of get two different ways of thinking about the data um, space that you're exploring so that's one possible approach as well yeah definitely humans in the loop with using like the labeling as the leverage thank you mm -hmm. Awesome. Priyal shared a link in the chat with how to use um, data augmentation with a programmatic labeling approach. Great question, Rahul. And thank you so much for your insight, Sydney, as well. Are there any other questions that we could help you with today? Christian asked, um, what about domain experts evaluating predicted model labels? It's a really great, um, really great idea. Priyal, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, when we kind of talk about evaluation, we typically talk about the validation and test splits as the evaluation splits, right? So uh, what kind of uh, we are doing here through uh, training data set generation and like the label model uh, generation is uh, generating training data is on top of which we are training a machine learning model. And then we are evaluating the performance of this entire pipeline through our evaluation splits, which are uh, the validation and the test splits. And as Roshni mentioned in her talk before, uh, we are kind of uh, have having these uh, evaluation splits hand labeled. Uh, and these splits would kind of form only a tiny fraction of your entire data. So you would use the programmatic interface to label uh, unlabeled data, which could be like in huge quantities, like a million examples, for instance, and you would need just a tiny sample, uh, which would give you kind of the confidence to say that the labels that have been generated through this process uh, make sense. So it's like, uh, when we talk about domain experts evaluating the predicted labels, it's kind of saying that we're using the validation and uh, test splits, and ensuring that the performance uh, there makes sense. And uh, yeah. sorry, uh, one more thing to add. Uh, and I would say, for instance, uh, there are many metrics that we use to evaluate performance. Right, one of them is the simplest one, which is accuracy. But we have a host of other metrics uh, in machine learning. So, for instance, if your uh, problem is um, contains an imbalance in the data distribution, then you would probably prefer to have, say, F1 metric uh, as the preferred source uh, of evaluation. Exactly. I think the key insight here is the predicted model labels will be quite a bit, right? Your model can predict labels on any data point. You don't need to label all of them. You just need to label a small fraction, which is the validation split. Um, Christian added a clarification. If I look for certain types of error in my model, it would be great if a subject matter could evaluate some of these errors. Yes, exactly. You got it. And uh, this is kind of uh, diving a, a bit into the active learning paradigm, right? Which is kind of natively supported here. Uh, active learning is, uh, I find, uh, a term that we use for just finding the most impactful data points that we can have the subject matter export label so that we use it in our next iteration for training. But this is exactly what we're natively doing here, right? We're exactly doing that. We're diving deep into the individual data points that uh, are being incorrectly classified. Uh, finding the highest impactful error buckets and then going on from there. So yeah, exactly right. This has been amazing. Ooh, there are more questions. We are here for all your questions. Uh, Kevin asks, what are the value adds of Snorkel Flow um, versus the Snorkel open source library? Can I take a stab at this, Priyal? 
Sure. Uh, so Snorkel, uh, the open source library was written by uh, the co-founding team of uh, Snorkel AI at their uh, during their time at Stanford, and it has been uh, used by multiple companies since then. And uh, uh, multiple people have collaborated uh, on that open source library. Uh, so what it does is uh, you you can basically uh, use it as any other open source library, and you could. Uh, incorporate it in your uh, existing workflows and use you know python based interfaces uh, um, through the library to write lfs and go from there uh, however uh, on top of uh, the snorkel flow library originally we have a uh, uh, platform that we call snorkel flow in our company snorkel ai so these are kind of the three terms Snorkel OSS being the open source library, Snorkel AI being the company, and Snorkel Flow being the platform that the company is building. Uh, so Snorkel Flow kind of removes the friction uh, that people have faced while using the open source library uh, because we have multiple of these low code interfaces that Roshan was talking about, which really makes it easy for a subject matter expert. Uh, people who typically tend to have uh, you know, lower expertise in writing Python-based functions. So for instance, uh, if I'm working with a doctor, uh, I would rather have them click a few buttons than write a few functions. So what we do in Snorkel Flow is we build these um, easy to use interfaces uh, and kind of have everything in one platform. So you not only just like write these labeling functions uh, in just a few clicks, uh, you're also able to just like with the push of a button train a model uh, deploy it, uh, view, uh, use these analysis tools to like, um, oh, when I said double clicking into an error bucket, I actually went double clicking into the error bucket because that's what we do in stuff with flow. Uh, and then it kind of applies the filters that Roshni was talking about. So you have filters applied, which would allow you to just view a few data points uh, that you are, uh, your model is for instance, not predicting correctly. And then you would go from there. Um, so does that make sense at all, Roshni? Do <laughs> you want to add something? Yeah, that was great. Uh, I guess the only thing, I was all 100% on, on point. Uh, the only thing I'd add, really small point, is Snorkel Flow is actually a full platform. So not only are we doing this inner loop of iterating on your uh, data and improving your model performance, but also the outer loop of deploying that model to production, monitoring it, writing splicing functions to um, kind of um, hone in on and focus on areas of the data that you care about in production and bring them back into the inner iterative loop. So Snorkel Flow is this full platform um, for ML application development versus Snorkel OSS is more of the research project focused specifically on labeling data. Um, so hopefully that was also a little bit helpful. So one thing to add there is uh, the Snorkel OSS also includes like these slicing and transformation functions. So not just uh, the labeling part of it, but also the slicing and the transformations. Yeah. But just all in Python code, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All in Python code and that click button easy for um, folks to collaborate on the same platform with. Exactly. Great, thanks. Can I ask one quick follow-up there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so is the Snorkel Flow platform like a general um, data source agnostic thing? Uh, Essentially, so we just upload our data, whether it's like uh, text or images or whatever, and then it should be able to work. Yeah, so um, Snorkel Flow, the platform is going to be data agnostic, whatever data you've got. Um, we're going to you know, be able to upload that. You're going to be able to view that data. You're going to be able to write labeling functions with that data and so forth. Uh, Snorkel AI, the company, has chosen to focus specifically on text space to kind of build out the full platform. And we're working on um, bringing in more data modalities. We're starting with time series, kind of getting us ready for other modalities. And then soon, um, within the next few months, we're going to be adding images, um, audio, video, and so forth. So um, building out the full platform across all of the different data modalities. Um, but again, very data agnostic. If you have you know, PDFs, if you have plain text, if you have numerical data, if you have um, uh, any kind of data, you can use it all on the Snorkel Flow platform. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, we are a team tiny startup right now, <laughs> just like 100 people or so at this point. Uh, so we're actively building all of our products. Awesome, thank you. Great. Uh, Stefano asked, um, 
will the presentation be recorded and posted? It is being recorded and I believe it will be posted. Um, I just don't know exactly where and when. Hopefully we can get some help from the coordinators. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, after a couple of days, the recordings will be uh, like processed and edited and shared uh, just to make sure everything's like crystal. So it will be shared uh, later on. Sounds good, thank you so much. Um, Sydney asked a, a great uh, question. Um, Am I completely off if I compare snorkel flow to ML flow or Databricks? Are they intending the same users or am I comparing apples to oranges? Priyal, do you want to take a stab at this one? Uh, I am not entirely sure what all ML flow does, but I believe it's a tool that we use for deploying applications. So it kind of packages what you have currently and you can use that package to deploy it pretty much anywhere, say AWS for instance, and then you can gather metrics from that. So Snorkel Flow, whereas is an end-to-end -end AI application development platform. So you start with some of your data, you label it using labeling functions, you train a model, uh, and then you also go ahead and deploy it. And then you can use this ML, uh, the ML Flow uh, package interface to actually label, uh, sorry, deploy the models that you're building in Snorkel Flow. Uh, and then go back from there. So it's like MLflow is uh, a kind of a library package that we actually use within Snorkel so that we are kind of uh, agnostic to uh, cloud environments or uh, uh, kind of interoperable with existing technologies for deployment. Yeah, I think um, that's a really great point, Priyal, is we wanna make sure that we can plug into any portion of your ML application development. So as Priyal gave all of these examples where you can kind of bring in existing information. So you might have an existing model you've been working on. You might have existing kind of legacy systems that help you figure out um, you know, what uh, label should be for a given domain. You might have existing dictionaries or ontologies. We want you to be able to bring in all of the information you've got, but we also wanna be able to have you kind of take the programmatic label data and run off with it. So we can help you export your training set. We can help you export your trained um, model uh, and you can deploy it anywhere you like. So interoperability for our snorkel flow is really important. The one thing that you'll kind of learn as you use the platform is actually the, the programmatic approach uh, and gives you key advantages at kind of all the steps in the full ML lifecycle. That's why we've kind of decided to make sure we go broad and expand on the full LF, um, uh, sorry, full ML application development process. And so um, you can come and go, but you'll find that you'll get benefits kind of at every step by staying within Snorkel Flow. Cool. Uh, hey everyone. I just wanted yeah. to ask, are you guys using any kind of auto ML like uh, PyCarrot or something for the model development stage? Yeah, Brielle mentioned this earlier, if you want to answer this question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, no, of no, course. Just, uh, I, I think you mentioned some tool. Uh, I don't think I'm exactly familiar with that tool itself, uh, but kind of for the auto ML capabilities that we have, it's like you press a button, uh, we train a few models for you, and then we choose the best model uh, based on the hyperparameter tuning uh, to uh, actually have it for application deployment. So it's like uh, instead of you having to you know go through uh, individual hyperparameters one by one, you can just uh, search through, say, a range of hyperparameters, and then it would choose whichever one works best. But also like, actively like incorporating. Grid search or something? So, grid search is one example. Yes. Uh, another example is using Bayes optimization. So, this is something that we're hmm. actively working on. So, you would just like specify that you you want to just like use a button switch and say that you want to use Bayes op instead, and it would. Uh, you can, you're also like free to provide a range within which you want to search if you have uh, expertise around, you know, the hyperparameters for your model. And then uh, it would search within that range using the base opt um, um, flow basically, yeah. Is, is that gonna be expanded for say like people who do wanna dive into those hyperparameters and like, uh, you know, I wanna train on F1, not accuracy. Uh, stuff like that yeah of course like you can you can use whichever metric you want to use uh, you can specify whether you want to have a primary metric for instance so if you want f1 instead of accuracy feel free to do that and it would anchor on that to measure your uh, 
performance of the model and choose which is best among say the f1 scores itself awesome right thanks mm -hmm. Kevin asked another question in chat. Are there any kinds of data that this data-centric approach does particularly well or poorly with? Uh, that's a really great question, Kevin. Uh, Priyal, do you have thoughts? I think it does really, really well with, uh, say, document classification. Uh, we've also seen it do pretty well with a number of other applications. Uh, so like, intent classification and conversational data, for instance, where uh, you can encode like domain expertise by saying if, you know, my, if, well, to detect the intent behind the user utterances. So you would say something like, um, if my user uh, is saying check balance, then the intent, for instance, in a banking chatbot would be to actually check balance. So instead of like having to go through individual data points and verify whether user means check balance or not, you could write such, an, such a labeling function, for instance. Uh, so I would say kind of these are the ones that I feel like it does particularly well with, but I think, I, I mean, I have a biased opinion <laughs> and I think it does really well with all kinds of applications. I'm trying to think if there is something which it doesn't work well with. Roshni, do you have anything in mind? Yeah, again, I'm also gonna have a pretty biased, um biased answer here. I think we've really explored the kind of wide array of text-based applications. And so, um, you know, uh, document classification or extracting out candidates from a document and classifying those or, uh, you know, these uh, conversational applications, these text-based applications we do really, really well on and we're starting to explore other spaces as well. Um, and so uh, another kind of space we're exploring is sequence tagging, being able to tag any sequence of text within a document and labeling it. Um, and so these are the places where we're starting to kind of see, um, I guess, challenges to, to our approach, right? Um, but we've, with the labeling-based approach, we're actually doing much, uh, programmatic labeling-based approach, we're actually doing much better than existing approaches that are out there and we're able to get you know, pretty competitive, if not better, F1 scores, even in these kind of more challenging situations uh, in a less amount of time than if you were to go through and kind of hand label the same number of data points to turn your model off of. Um, and so I'm gonna struggle to find the poorly with uh, use cases there as well. And I guess uh, we kind of feel of it more like a paradigm shift in the way that you think of developing applications themselves. So whatever kind of, machine learning application you're building, you would require data to train your model on, right? So it's it's just that instead of saying that tr getting training data and training a model as being two entirely separate interfaces, you have some interfaces which would allow you to kind of go through this these both steps together. Um, so it's like entirely a paradigm shift in the way that you're building applications. So it's not just about like, working on individual or this approach being suitable to individual problems. It's like thinking of it uh, as a collaboration uh, between the two steps. Exactly. Um, and I think, you know, Snorkel AI, the company has found that we can build kind of low code, no code UI uh, for certain types of applications really quickly. And I think the exciting challenges that kind of await the company is to be able to expand that to other types of data. Um, and again, provide low code or no code UI to, to allow and encourage the domain experts to contribute their knowledge more effectively. Um, but you know, to Priyal's point, it's a, um, it's a shift in the way we start thinking about how we're gonna develop AI applications. And instead of focusing solely on iterating on the model, we're gonna iterate on both, both the data and labeling the data uh, quickly and programmatically, as well as on the model. And so we're gonna work with both approaches to get kind of the best performance possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sydney asks, uh, have other modalities been explored? I think I saw some examples of images on the blog or tutorial. Uh, Priyal's nodding, so would you like to go ahead and ask this question? <laughs> yeah, of course. So Are those uh, cha the, challenging at all? I was just curious on the yeah. challenges. Uh, sorry, what do you mean by the challenges? like the ones that seem to be a little bit trickier than text classification or intent classification, like you talked about? 
Mm-hmm. That's a great question. So uh, I would again refer to you some of the papers uh, that the co-founding team has written. I know that Paroma, for instance, has a paper that uh, where she explored, you know, these domain-specific primitives for images. So, for instance, for text, uh, uh, it works so well because you can, you know, write this function uh, in kind of an if-else statement and say if my email subject contains this keyword, then I can label it as label X, for instance. Whereas for images, it would kind of be a little more challenging than this, uh, where you would have to, I mean, you can't really go ahead and specify if pixel number 0, 10 to 10, 20 has blue <laughs> color, then you would want to label it as something. You would need some kind of an interface to operate within that. So I know that Paroma's paper, for instance, has these, what she calls domain specific, domain specific primitives. So something like, um, uh, say the texture of the image. So you would uh, or let's say image segmentation. So if you have like um, an X-ray of a bone, uh, you would want to run some image segmentation algorithm on, on it already. And then one, once that image segmentation gives you some output, you would say if the area to parameter ratio of this segment is greater than, I don't know, five, then I want to label it as a tumor, something like that. So it gets a little bit more challenging in that you need more interfaces to work with that data. Thanks, Roshni, for linking the paper. Thank you. And also another way to work with other data modalities in, is uh, in a, a multimodal fashion, right? You, uh, when I know that um, Jared has one paper where uh, he has uh, worked with radiologists uh, to uh, have both text and images of I don't know, some kind of data. I'm a little hazy on the details of the paper. EHR or something. Yeah, yeah, the patient. Yes, I, I've seen that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you're using uh, the metadata corresponding to an image as well as the image itself in a, in a multimodal fashion uh, to uh, kind of deploy your uh, application. Thank you. So we're approaching kind of the last five minutes. If there's any other burning questions, uh, Priyal and I are here to help answer them. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, discussion here after our talk. I enjoyed all of the questions so very much and I'm so grateful for all of you who've attended. Um, thank you so much Priyal for uh, hosting this with me um, and thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. If you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to either of us. Uh, it's our first names at snorkel.ai is the easiest way. Thank you, Roshni and Priyal, for the insightful presentation. It was quite an engaging discussion. Uh, have a great, great night. <laughs>